ensure our own biases. Does your neighborhood determine your future? How does discrimination impact people's bodies? And what can we do about it? Join the conversation on this season of Glad You Asked. Watch now, only on YouTube. Kendall's 30-minute pop ride. This should be fun. Get out home motivation anytime you want it. We are climbing through this forest. Let's get it. Tap into your motivation at OnePeloton.com.
now I got a sound man, now I got a PA, but I still got a foyer full of people petting kittens. Uh, Talon, would you run all those folks on in here, please? Tell them that the kittens will be around in an hour when we're done. An hour, yeah. <laughs> Virgil's looking at his watch. Do you feel displaced, Virg, on this side of the room now? I, and, uh, you know, and really, when you're over here, you get in my good side. Yeah, this side's not so good. Uh, <laughs> do what? <laughs> I know what you're thinking. If, if this side is your good side, yikes, no. All right, come on in, everybody. Let's get things started here. Lots to do today, and we want to make sure that we get it all done. We're going to start by singing number 243 this morning, I Am Resolved, and we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and then verse number 4. Skipping that third verse, the loneliest verse in the hymnal in a Baptist church is verse number 3, isn't it? Unless there are only three verses, then it gets sung. But today, 1, 2, and 4 of I Am Resolved, number 243. Please stand with me if you're able. 1, 2, and 4 of 2, 4, 3. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. So Easter, man, you sang incredibly well. And then during the revival on Sunday, boy, you really brought your A game. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, amazing. Let's keep it up, shall we? Sing out good and strong on verse number two. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. All right, good singing this morning. Glad that you're here. Thank you for coming. We have some guests here with us to, this morning. Uh, Brother Mike Platts, what's the name of Mama down here? Spooky. All right, got Spooky down here and four of her kittens. No names yet. Uh, are you looking to get rid of these kittens in time? Couldn't be convinced, sorry. Now, they're not ready yet, right? Next week, maybe. So if you enjoyed some of these little kittens here and you want to get one, see Brother Mike after church. You've already gotten rid of one? Okay, gotcha. So uh, they're going like uh, hotcakes, right? Because not, they're not going like kittens. Sometimes kittens don't go anywhere, right? Sometimes people are like, uh-uh. But uh, so get down here. But Spooky's yours. She's not up on the, on the block. Yeah, there you go. So you can't have Spooky. But we're glad that Spooky here is here and her kittens. We Every week during the Hatfield-McCoy program, that is, we try to bring a different critter in. And we've never had the feline variety before. And so what a blessing it is. I heard some of you got to enjoy them down there. The rest of you, if you didn't and you want to, you can see them after the service. All right, so what do we need to do? We need to pray, don't we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. What a blessing we've enjoyed the last several weeks here. We've been very, very busy people, cleaning the building up for the spring season and then decorating the building up after the busy Easter Sunday and then hitting the ground running with Brother Areza 
last Sunday morning and what a blessing he was to us. Thank you for his testimony, his spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost on him as he preached. Thank you for the decisions that were made. Father, we don't want revival to end. Revival is not something that's supposed to come and go. We ought to always seek it and ever perpetuate it. Father, would you do that this morning? Help us to keep moving forward. Lord, thank you for 14 people who put their faith in Christ last week, four of them being baptized. God, we're grateful that you allowed us to see that this week. We'd like to see more of it. Help us to be diligent and faithful to invite folks to church and to share our testimony and the gospel with them. Help them to say yes to Christ and to follow in baptism. Lord, we pray your blessing on this service this morning. Thank you for those who are here. Thank you for folks that we weren't able to see the last week or two because of various reasons, and now they're back. We're grateful for their persistence. God, I pray you keep your hand on each and every person here this morning. Give us each the message that we need. Speak to our hearts, please. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Second song is number 220, He Leadeth Me. And just like the other, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of number 220. He leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. What e'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Edom's bowers bloom, by water still or troubled sea still tis his hand that leadeth me he leadeth me he leadeth me by his own hand he leadeth me his faithful follower i would be for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Very good, very good. Praise the Lord. All right, we need to get a contest count here this morning. So, Brother Brent, Brother Rick, would you please do the honor of counting your sides this morning? The score as of Wednesday night was 191 for the McCoys and 171 for the Hatfields. So only a 20-point disparity there. Is there anyone in the nursery this morning, Mother? No. Is there anyone anywhere else in the building? I guess it's their fault, right, if they're not in here during the count, unless they're a Hatfield. Get in here, Hatfields. You're going to miss the count. <laughs> That's true. There are five more Hatfields down on this side, right? <laughs> Thank you, Darwin, for pointing that out. 
All right, Brother Rick, do you have a count for the McCoys this morning? <laughs> 21 McCoys. All right. And that makes it a total of two. Carry the one. 212 McCoys uh, as of now. Brother Brent, what do you have? 30 Hatfields, which takes the Hatfields to 201. So only 11 points behind. Now, McCoys, where are your guests this morning? McCoys, are there any guests on the McCoy side? All right, doesn't look like there are any guests. Are there guests on the Hatfield side? Jeanette, introduce her, will you please? Hi, Melissa, we're honored that you're here this morning. Thank you very much for coming. We're not always this crazy, but about eight weeks out of the spring we are. Glad that you're here. Dawn, introduce your guests, will you? Wonderful. Good to have the Fullers here with us this morning. Thank you, folks, for coming. Moving to Tennessee this Friday, so we got them in the nick of time, didn't we? We're glad you're here. Shannon. Hi, Missy. Missy, is that right? Did I say that right? Nikki, I'm sorry. My hearing is very bad, and especially when it comes to my wife. You know, it's selective sometimes. So, Nikki, I'm glad that you're here this morning. Thank you for coming and being our guest. Would you give all of these folks a nice, warm welcome this morning? And so it seems that the Hatfields also won the bonus points, doesn't it? So we're going to add 25 to that score, making the Hatfields' new total 226 points to the McCoys 212 points so brother Mike what do you have that's true they're non-human however <laughs> then again we do count you Mike so no that's <laughs> I'm just picking on you Praise the Lord. So the Hatfields, you've taken the lead for the first time in the program. But uh, it's anybody's game at any time. That's always clear. So keep that in mind. Oh, let's see here. I need a tough Hatfield. Somebody who's not afraid of anything. Charles, okay, come on down. I need a tough McCoy. Winston, come on down. All right. Come on to the platform, please. Charles, pick a number between 1 and 10. Winston, pick a number between 1 and 10. All right. The answer was 7 on the nose. So congratulations, Charles. All right. Let's see here. So I only need one of these. Will you put that somewhere? All right. We have a bow and arrow here. Not a real one. A toy one with suction cups and a toy knife. Does anybody remember when toys were bowie knives and bow and arrows? God bless America. All right, so let's see here. You can put these away some, please. All right, please put those on for your safety. Now, Winston, this is a bit tricky, all right? There's no notch in these arrows, and there's really no good rest on this bow handle either. Don't try pulling it apart. There's no point in it. So what you have to do is the best you can, you know, get the, the arrow on the string, and you're going to shoot it at Charles. What's the name of that guy with the apple on his head? Who? William, William Tell. That's it. So our own little hillbilly version of William Tell here. So... I don't know, how far away should he be? Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, you know, that's probably, probably safe. All right. Don't shoot at the baptistry, please. Should we switch sides? Yeah. Time out. Switch sides. I don't want you shooting the arrows into the baptistry, which is a good likelihood. All right, that's true.
going to offer any points, by the way, for any of this. We want to make sure the points stay pertinent to the goals here. Okay, what are we doing now? Oh, that's it. I think we sing another song. Third song of the morning is number 157, Brent, is that right? 157, Jesus paid it all. Oh, I know, I lost my uh, order of service. That's what's happening here. 157 in your book, Jesus paid it all. We'll sing all four verses here. Don't get draggy now. Let's keep the energy high here on number 157. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Very good. Thank you for your singing this morning. Young people, kids, elementary age, you may be dismissed and head to class. Thank you, Shannon, for teaching those little guys. We appreciate that. They probably appreciate it too. We're turning in our Bibles this morning to Revelation in chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. And we'll be reading the first 11 verses of Revelation 1. Revelation is the very last book in your Bible. Chapter 1 is the very first chapter of that book. You probably gathered that by now. Revelation chapter number 1 verses 1 through 11. I'll read aloud. You follow along silently, please. The Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth 
And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing here this morning on the message. I'm not sure, Lord, that I'm equipped well enough to preach this message, but I pray that you'll help me. I pray that you'll give me wisdom, clarity of thought, maybe an understanding beyond what my current ability already is. I pray that you'll help our people as they listen and hear this morning to have faith in the word of God, also understanding maybe beyond their ability. But God, I pray that today you would be magnified and glorified, and I pray also that your people would be drawn closer to you. Please let that be the case, bind the devil and his demons off of our service off of our minds and hearts this morning. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Please keep your Bibles handy this morning. We're going to turn to a few different uh, passages that are not going to be up on the wall for you. So Revelation chapter 1, we're going to go through this text kind of briefly, but there's so much of importance to bring out that I want to do that before we get into the primary part of the message. First off, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Of course, that word revelation, the root word is reveal. So this is Christ revealing to the Apostle John things that are going to happen. Now, some of those things have already happened, chapters 1, 2, and 3. But from chapter 4 on through the end of the book, chapter 22, it's all prophecy. Prophecy is God's foretelling of things that haven't happened yet. And so even for us, beyond chapters 1, 2, and 3, revelation has yet to occur for us to see. So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So Jesus is presenting this information to John, letting him know what's going to happen. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And so the angel came and ministered to John and gave the message to him. Verse 2, and this is speaking of John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So John is giving testimony of what he saw happen. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is God inspiring the men who sat and wrote it to tell us the story that they saw. That's what the book of Luke is. A physician, doctor named Luke, who sat down and wrote the book of Luke. He sat down and wrote the book of Acts. The apostle Paul tells us of the Damascus Road instance and uh, the epistles to the churches. John here in Revelation telling us what is going to come to pass. So when you read the Bible, these are eyewitness testimonies. I know some of you probably like to sit and watch court TV, right? And you sit there and you're, you're interested in the cases and what's going on. 
and that eyewitness testimony is always interesting to hear. And that's what you're reading when you read the Bible. Eyewitness testimony. Verse number three. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So there's a blessing on those who read and study the book of Revelation and then also obey what God tells them. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. So there are seven primary churches that are scattered throughout the continent of Asia at this time, and John is going to be writing letters to those seven churches. And he says to those churches, Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. That's the first of two times that we're going to read that, which was and which is and which is to come. You understand that God exists outside of time. God created everything that we know. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth. You have time, space, and matter in that verse. In the beginning is time. God created the heavens is space, and the earth is matter. God created time, space, and matter, and he exists outside of those things. How can you create it except you exist outside of it? And so God, when he views time, he doesn't view time. God is ever-present at every moment of history. We can't even understand that, can we? We can't wrap our minds around it. You know why? Because we're not God. His thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are above our ways. We cannot comprehend the mind of God. Uh, he created us. It would be ridiculous to think that the creation could understand the creator. There's no possible way. That's why when God told Moses, uh, when Moses says, Who should I say sent me? Tell them that I am sent because God is the great I am. He is and was and is that which is to come, and he's ever present in all of those times. Verse 5, and, Jesus, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the audience here are the churches, Christian people, if you've never put your faith in Christ, then you need to do that for the forgiveness of your sins so that they might be washed away by the blood of Christ. See, all of us are indebted to God because we've sinned against Him. It's as though you went speeding down the road and you got a ticket for violating the law and now the township is going to hold you to paying that fine. And if you don't pay that fine when you go to renew your license, they're not going to let you renew it. You're indebted to them. And until that debt is cleared up, you can't move forward. And in life, it's that way. Until our sin debt is cleared up, we can't move forward. And we're all sinners. You'd be ridiculous to claim otherwise. Man, when I was a little kid, I was lying to my parents to get out of trouble. Right? Right? I don't know if you ever did anything like that, but I did. How did this break? I don't know. That was my most clever response. I don't know. That's all I got, I'm telling you. Who broke this window? I don't know. Were you playing baseball in the backyard again? I don't know. You don't know? You really don't know. Anyways, PTSD from childhood flashing back here. Verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Look at there. Did you know that you're a priest with God? The high priest used to be the only one with access directly to God, and now Jesus has made us priests. That's why in a few moments you can walk down an aisle and get on your knees and talk directly to God. You don't have to come to me and say, hey, will you tell God this on my behalf? You don't, you don't have to do that. I, I'm, not, I'm not a gatekeeper to God on your behalf. There's no confessional booth around here this morning. You don't have to go through any man to get to God. You just have to go through Jesus Christ. Verse number 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, meaning crucified him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And look how this verse ends, Even so, amen. That's pretty tough preaching, isn't it? Read it again. Every eye shall see him when Christ comes for his people. They also which pierced him, 
So those people that crucified Christ will see him return. And all kindreds of the earth shall do what? Wail. You usually wail when things are good or when things are bad. When you've crucified the Son of God and he's coming back, it's bad for you. And what does John say? Even so. They're just going to get what they justly deserve. You say, man, that sounds hard. Yeah, because God is a God of justice as well as a God of love. Here's the thing. In love, he gives his son to the world. And yet many will reject him. The offer was made. If you choose to reject it, that's on you. Say we go to lunch tomorrow. I don't know. Where do you want to go to lunch? Fuddruckers, they got good hands. Sure. So we're in line, and we're at lunch, and, and we're ordering, and I say to you, hey, let me get your lunch today. And you go, nah, you know, I'll take care of it myself. And then we pay our own tabs, and we sit down, and we have a nice hamburger and probably a chocolate shake, right? That's a good thing to get at Fuddruckers. And uh, we eat our meal, and we, we uh, have a good conversation. And then as we're leaving, I say, man, I hope you have a good day. And you say to me, well, it could be better. And I say, well, why? Why do you say that? Well, you could have offered to buy my lunch. I did offer to buy my lunch. Or buy your lunch. I did offer to buy it. Yeah, but you didn't do it. You told me no. Yeah, but you should have done it anyway. Who's the one with the bigger problem here, me or you? You are. The offer was made you said no. That's on you. You don't have any right on the way out the restaurant to say, eh, he didn't pay. There are going to be people at the judgment seat. They're going to say, God, you're not doing right by me. And he'll say, how? He'll say, because you're sending me to hell. He'll say, I offered to forgive you. I offered to save you. I offered to give you a home in heaven. I did everything that it took to redeem you. And when that offer was made to you, you said no. Even so, amen. That's the way it is. There'll be no argument to the judgment seat otherwise. Verse number 8, this is Jesus saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet, the beginning and the ending. That means everything begins with Jesus and everything will end with Jesus. Verse 9, I, John, who also, I'm sorry, I didn't finish, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. We've already covered that. The Almighty. That's pretty much the top, isn't it? The greatest in strength. If we decided to have a, an arm wrestling contest in this church, and uh, we'll have the Hatfields versus the McCoys, and uh, we'll go through, and every Hatfield will arm wrestle every McCoy, and we'll have an elimination type thing. Then when we find out who's the strongest, then they have to arm wrestle everybody on their own team. And once we get to the very final person who has beat every other person in arm wrestling, they would be the, the pinnacle, wouldn't they? They'd be the strongest. They'd be the top in the room. And Jesus is the Almighty. He is the top in the room. Which room? Every room. He is the king of the earth. He is the king of all kings. And he is the lord of all lords. There is none greater than him. Verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. By the way, everybody has a tough time. I know you're going through a tough time right now. Come back tonight. We're preaching on going through tough times. Everybody deals with tribulation. Don't quit because you think you're the only one. Elijah's in a cave and he's complaining. God, I'm the only one left. And God says, no, no, there are 7,000 more just like you. See, when you get to thinking you're the only one doing it, God says, no, no, there are thousands more. You're not alone. You can stay after it. Patient, uh, companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. You know what patience is? Putting up with it. Putting up with it. Man, we got to go visit 
the homes of our bus riders sometimes. We have to talk to their parents about their behavior. And sometimes their parents are like, thank you for telling me. Now I can make sure to help straighten them out. And sometimes parents say, what do you mean? My child's an angel, and I doubt they did anything that you're saying. And we got to deal with that. And you know how many times I've dealt with that in the 30, however many years I've been working with, with bus routes and bus ministries and children and teenagers? You know how many times I've dealt with that? I don't even know. But I know this. God says, just keep being patient. Do it one more week. Okay, then we're done after this week? No, then we're going to do it one more week. When do these weeks end? I'll let you know. Be patient. Of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos. So what's happened here, John has been exiled. They're sending him to this island called Patmos, and he's there just sort of shipwrecked, right? Not shipwrecked. They dropped him off and said, we're never coming back for you. And he's there, why? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Brother Razor preached on it last week. We're seeing, uh, I, I hesitate to use the word persecution, although by definition it's correct. Let me mention last week or maybe the week before, the church in Canada whose pastor was imprisoned for holding services. That's persecution. The government came around and put a fence around the church property to keep people out of the building. That's persecution. We're being harassed for being Christians. But persecution is soon coming. You know, we almost... Remember the days when we thought Canada was like American light? Diet America? Uh, now they're... You know what they're doing in Ontario... If you're on the street, walking or in a motor vehicle, police can approach you, question you as to why you're in public. And if you don't have a valid, legitimate reason, they can arrest you. For walking down the street, for driving down the road, no probable cause, just pull you over, and if you don't have a valid reason, take you to jail. That's insane. That, my friend, is a police state. Hello? You guys are awfully quiet about this stuff. Wait till it's your boy that gets picked up. Wait till it's your daughter just trying to drive somewhere and, and she gets pulled over. Huh? It's on its way. In fact, this book of Revelation, we did a series on it last summer. Figured, what a good time to do it during a pandemic. Let's talk Revelation. It's all online. There, there are about 30 messages, I think, on the book of Revelation. And you can get on there and listen to it. Hey, we're heading to globalism. Now, we're trying to slow the progress as much as possible. But that is the end result that is unavoidable and inescapable. We're trying to keep us from heading that way for our own sakes, for the sakes of our children and our grandkids. Our great-grandkids, we won't be here. We don't care about them, right? Anyway, I'm kidding. But uh, we're trying to slow it, but it's inevitable. And so here, John is exiled to an island. Why? For being a Christian. That's it. Number 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And here's our text verse. And once we start preaching, you're going to wonder what all this had to do. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. If you ever wonder what the Lord's, Lord's voice sounds like, it's like a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And that's all we need to get into this morning. But verse number 10 is our text verse. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I want to talk to us this morning about the importance of the Lord's day. Well, you go to Genesis chapter 2. Please. Genesis is the very first book in your Bible. We started with the last. We're going to the first now. Genesis chapter number 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 here. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. So God created the heavens and the earth, as we said in Genesis 1-1. And now in Genesis 2-1, the heavens and the earth were finished. So in one chapter of the Bible, God created everything, right? 
and all the host of them. That means everything that they contain. And look here, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So Genesis chapter 2, the first three verses focus on the seventh day of the week. If you look at a calendar, if you've not been well versed in this, I'm not trying to be condescending, but not everybody may know this, the very first day of the week is Sunday. And then the seventh day of the week is Saturday. Now, as you read through the first chapter of Genesis, you'll see this phrase repeated a few times, and the evening and the morning were the first day, and the evening and the morning were the second day. It's interesting that God calls the day's beginning in the evening, and it ends in the morning. So the Jewish Sabbath started Friday night, at sundown and it ended Saturday night at sundown the evening and the morning so uh, what we've got here to keep from confusing us we just are going to understand this morning that the Sabbath day was the seventh day which was Saturday Sunday is the first day of the week now what did God do on the seventh day he rested he chose to rest. Now here's the thing about God. God is omnipotent, omnipotent, if you want to break it down into its prefix. God is all-powerful. Omni meaning all, potent, powerful. God is all-powerful. Does, does God need to rest? No, he does not. But God chose to rest. How many of you have ever rested when you didn't need to rest? Yeah. See, God also chose to rest when he didn't need to rest. You know, I can sit down and have a nice meal, and that will nourish my body and give me the energy I need, but if there is a fudge sickle in the freezer, I might have one. I don't need it, but I'm going to enjoy it. God doesn't need to rest, but he's going to enjoy rest. And so God teaches us a principle here, and it's the principle of rest. He worked six days, and he rested one day. Now, we all know people that rest six days and work one day, don't we? Let's not be that kind of person. Let's be busy and industrious, serving the Lord with fervency. And so he worked six day, as days, and he rests one day. And what does it say about that seventh day? He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. The word sanctified is a Bible word that means set apart. So like let's say that you're, uh, you get your paycheck and every week you're setting apart $25 maybe for a trip, a vacation or something. So you've sanctified that $25 every single week. You've set it apart for a specific use. God says, I'm sanctifying the seventh day for a specific use. And that use is what? Rest. And so that's the purpose of the seventh day. Because that in it, he rested from all his work, which God created and made. So God created all things in six days, and he rested on the seventh day, and he set that day apart. Very important to, to focus on that. He set it apart for rest. Now, based on his precedent, I'm sorry, this precedent, God also told his people to rest on the seventh day. Will you go to Exodus chapter number 20, please? The second book of the Bible is the book of Exodus, so you don't have to go very far. There are 50 chapters in Genesis, so if you keep seeing numbers like 36 and 41, keep going. Exodus chapter number 20. This is the chapter of the Bible that gives us the Ten Commandments. Moses comes out of the mountain with two tablets of stone, and God had written on those tablets with his own finger the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, we're going to read verses 8 through 11. 
This is what God said. Remember the Sabbath day. So God has now given a name to the seventh day. And it's called the Sabbath. And he says this to his people. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. Is that true? Did he bless the Sabbath day in Genesis 2? Yes, he did. And hallowed it. Hallowed means consecrated or holy. So he made that day holy, which we already read there. Verse, uh, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? Holy. So God has made the Sabbath day or the seventh day two things now, a day of rest and a holy day, a day that's been set apart for him. It's his day. It is to be holy. It is to be for rest. It is blessed of God, and it is hallowed of God, or consecrated, or sanctified, as we read in Genesis chapter number 2. Now, something else we learn about the Sabbath, as was taught by Jesus. You may remember the story of Christ and his disciples, and on the Sabbath day, which is the seventh day uh, the, of the week, Saturday, and they're working their way through this cornfield, and what are they doing? They're hungry, so they're picking corn and eating it. I don't even understand that, because I've picked corn on the cob before off of the stalk, and it's not ready to eat. I don't know. Hopefully there's a pot of boiling water somewhere. Amen. But uh, they're picking corn, and they're eating the corn. And here the Pharisees show up. Who are the Pharisees? They're the self-righteous people. That they think they're better than everybody else. Those are the Pharisees. You say, I think I'm better than other people. Then you're a Pharisee. You are. You're self-righteous. And you're not better than anybody else. You say, yes, I am. You're really a Pharisee. Because you're doubling down on this thing. You're not. You're not better than anybody else. You're not better than anybody else because you have more money than them. You're not better than anybody else because you're a different color than them. You're not better than anybody else because you live in a different zip code than them. You're not better than anybody else. And so, don't be a Pharisee, mini sermon. Back to the main sermon. The Pharisees say, look at your disciples, Jesus. They're violating the Sabbath day. They're picking corn on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to do any work, but they're picking corn and they're eating it. And Jesus says, do you remember when David and his men were running from Saul and they got to the temple and they asked the priest permission to eat the showbread from off the table of showbread in the temple? And then he says this in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27 the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath see these Pharisees had turned these commandments of God into a checklist to mark off for posterity's sake rather than finding them purposeful and meaningful the purpose of the Sabbath day was to give man rest, to help him slow down, to let him take a breath, to help him decompress, to help him alleviate stress. It was a gift from God to man. And man wasn't created to fulfill the Sabbath the Sabbath was created to help man. After the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, a change comes. 
Jesus said, what about the law? He said, I came not to destroy the law, but to do what? Fulfill the law. Jesus was the only person who ever walked in flesh and blood that ever perfectly kept the Old Testament law. We read in Paul's writings that the law wasn't even actually given to us so that we can keep it. It was given to the Old Testament Jews to show them that they couldn't keep it. See, God gave Adam and Eve one commandment, and they couldn't keep it. But they, man's still self-righteous. So God gives them ten commandments, and they can't keep those. But man is still self-righteous. And so he gives them over 600 laws, and they still can't keep those, and yet still self-righteous. God's trying to show man, look, you aren't perfect. You can't satisfy my holiness. You've sinned against me. And I'm giving you this law to show you that you can't do it. So that you'll come to me and say, I can't do it. And then I'll say, good, let me do it for you in offering my son in your place. When I was a teenager, people talked to me about heaven and hell. I used to think God had a scale, not like a bathroom scale, but the old kind of scales. You know what I'm talking about when I do this? Good. That's a scale, right. Weights on one side and product on the other, right? If you need, uh, you need four ounces of sugar, you put a four ounce weight on one side or maybe four one ounce weights. Why do we waste time like this? And then the sugar on the other side. You balance that scale. And I thought, God's going to put my sin on one side. He's going to put my good th deeds on the other side. And I need to get my good deeds heavier than my sin. And if they're heavier, I get to go to heaven. But if my sin is heavier than my good deeds, elevator going down, it's not that way. Here's how everyone's scale looks. This is sin, this is good deeds. You know how your scale looks? Boom, just like that. You don't have enough righteousness to get to heaven. You don't have enough good deeds to overcome your sin. And that's what the law was teaching. You guys don't, you, you don't get it. You can't make it work. But man in his pride refuses to admit that. So Jesus fulfills the law, and so the law becomes moot because it had fulfilled its purpose of showing man that man was sinful. And so now we're not, no longer held to the law. Now let me say, there are two aspects to the law, the ceremonial law and the moral law. We're still bound to keep the moral law. Ceremonial law, however, unnecessary for you and I. What's part of the moral law? Thou shalt not steal. That's still in place. Thou shalt not kill, meaning murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Those are still in place. But go ahead and wear polyester, right? The mixing of fabrics and so forth. So we're not bound by the Old Testament law anymore. So we're not bound to keep the Sabbath anymore. Now, if you want to mow your grass on the seventh day, you can mow it. If you want to uh, go pick some corn and eat it, you can do that. It's not unlawful to do so. But now we see in the book of Acts a transition. Will you turn to Matthew 28 for me, please? Matthew 28. Christians now know that the keeping of the Sabbath is not something needful to do out of obedience, but out of blessing. Key statement in the message this morning. Christians now know that the keeping of the Sabbath was not something needful to do out of obedience, but out of blessing. See, a day of rest is still a good idea. A day to take it easy and not work is still a good idea. Look at us Americans. We can't say amen to that. Because we've been drilled and drilled and drilled. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. You know you can take a day of rest and not be lazy? And if you disagree with that, you just call God lazy. Huh? Did God rest on the seventh day? Yes or no? Is God lazy? Yes or no? Are you lazy if you take a day of rest? See, we've been beaten down into submission. Huh? 
you're not lazy to take a day of rest. And if anybody calls you lazy for taking a day of rest, tell them to go kick rocks. God took a day of rest. Given the resurrection of Christ occurring on the first day of the week, the disciples and believers began to assemble on the first day of the week. Look at Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, so the Sabbath is the day of rest, right? The seventh day. So in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, remember this, night and morning, evening and morning, right? We talked about this. You got it? All right. Three of you got it. Good. The rest of you, we're holding you back. We're, they're going to dismiss in about 20 minutes. You all have to stay back for afternoon session. So where are we at? As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. You remember what we talked about two weeks ago? What's going on in the sepulcher? It's empty. Why? Jesus was in the sepulcher. Where is he now? Not in the sepulcher. He's resurrected, hasn't he? It's the first day of the week. After the resurrection of Christ, Christians began to meet on the first day of the week to memorialize and commemorate the resurrection of Jesus. So the day of worship, if you will, the day of holiness, if you will, the day of Sabbath, if you will, shifted from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. Will you look at Acts chapter 20, the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, probably a quarter inch worth of pages in your Bible. And that information was not at all helpful because every Bible is so different. But why not? Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 7. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 7. And upon the what? First day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, you know what that breaking of bread was? Lord's Supper. Paul, what? Preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until when? Don't complain about me ever again. I have never preached to you until midnight. 11.45, no. Uh, Paul, so what do we have here? What do we have in this early church going on? We have the first day of the week, the disciples come together to do what? Observe the Lord's Supper and hear preaching. You know what we do around here? On the first day of the week, we assemble together. On the first Sunday of the month, we observe the Lord's Supper and we listen to preaching. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, please. Keep moving forward. You're in Acts. The next book is Romans. The next book will be 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 2. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. First Corinthians 16, 2. Upon the what? First day of the week. Let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. What's this verse talking about? Tithing and giving offerings. So, when are we giving our tithes and our offerings? First day of the week. So here we see clearly that the disciples in the early church on the first day of the week assembled together, observed the Lord's Supper, gave their tithes and their offerings, and listen to preaching. What does that sound like to you? Church. It's what we're doing. It's what we do. It's what we do every Lord's Day. Revelation 1, verse number 10. John said, I was in the Spirit on the what? Lord's Day. What day of the week do you think it was? First day of the week. The first day of the week is the Lord's Day. That's our introduction. Let's preach this sermon, shall we? It is the Lord's Day. Is there an apostrophe in Revelation 1.10? 
you don't know because you're in 1 Corinthians 16. I'll tell you, I was in the spirit on the capital L, O-R-D, apostrophe S, day. What does it mean for a proper noun to have an apostrophe S? It's possessive. It's not plural. If I said Joel's motorcycle, J-O-E-L apostrophe S, that doesn't mean there are many Joel's with one motorcycle. It means that that motorcycle belongs to Joel. And you keep that in mind if you ever see it in the parking lot, please. Uh, the Lord's day. Proper noun, Lord, apostrophe S, possessive, meaning the noun to follow belongs to the proper noun. The motorcycle belongs to Joel, and the day belongs to, then why do you act like it's yours? It's his day, not your day. That's what we did, didn't we? I'll tell you what you say. This country's a mess. Yeah, and let me tell you one of the reasons why. Christians don't observe the Lord's day like it belongs to His anymore. God's people have to get back to living as though the day belongs to the Lord. Some of you are older than I. I'm getting up there, though. I'm nearly one half of a century old. That's one way to look at it, isn't it? half of a century. When I was 25, I said, I'm now an antique. Because things that are 25 years old are considered antiques. I'm like, I'm an antique. How many of you would consider a 25-year-old an antique? Only unless you're under 25, right? Uh, half a century old. You know, I was born in 1972. Boy, that just seems like yesterday, doesn't it? Uh, some of you, though, were born before that. You were born a decade or two or three, or sometimes four decades before that. So you remember a day that I don't remember. You remember a day when the Lord's day was the Lord's day. You remember a day when if you needed gas, you better get it on Saturday because you're not getting it on Sunday. And you remember a day when if you needed butter for the potatoes on Sunday, you better buy it on Saturday. And if you needed uh, to ride the bus, you better ride it on Saturday because the bus isn't running on Sunday. How many of you remember those days? Yeah, I don't remember those days. When I was born in 1972, I have no recollection of the time at all. My first memory uh, is, I don't know, I can't even think of what my first memory was. Probably about four years old, maybe. So 1976, that's as far as I, I can go back in my memory bank. And I don't remember not being able to go to the store on Sunday. Maybe some were closed. I don't know. I don't remember that. I don't remember people not working on Sundays. In fact, back in the day, only, <laughs> I hate to use the phrasing, essential workers worked on the Lord's Day, didn't they? Maybe the police, hospital employees, things of that nature. But nobody, nobody walked into Hairman's to fry hamburgers on Sunday. Nobody worked at Woolco back then, right? The photo mat booth was empty. Huh? I don't know if any of these make sense or not. It's as far back as I can go. Huh? Why? It was all shut down. Hey, nobody played soccer on Sunday. Nobody's travel hockey team went and played on Sunday. None of that happened. Why? Why? Anybody know why? It was the Lord's Day. What do we do today? We send people to work. Buses run. Uber runs. Taxis run. Some Christians go, oh, overtime on Sunday. I'll take it. But you got plenty of money, but I want more. We just sell out the Lord's Day, don't we? Let's see, I got notes here. That's just off the top of my head. It used to be, I'm told, because I wasn't alive during this time, that no one worked on Sundays that wasn't essential. 
that nothing was open. No gas station, no grocery store, no restaurants. There were no sporting events, nothing to play, nothing to spectate. No public transportation ran. People didn't watch television or listen to the radio. There was no shopping. There was no buying. There was no selling. There was no trading. You know, you act like those times were better. I don't know. I don't remember hearing about FedEx buildings getting shot up by employees and eight people being murdered back in the 40s. I'm not saying crime is something new. People are people. There's nothing new under the sun. But I'll say this. Our country used to be a lot more God-fearing, moral, and decent than it is today. Nobody was walking around in sweatpants with the word juicy on the behind. Because if any, any, any self-respecting mother or father whose daughter walked down the staircase and something like that, they just said, march yourself right back up those stairs and put something different on. Now they don't do that because mom's walking around in them and dad's too scared of her to say anything about it. Huh? I love my wife and she is her own woman, but if she ever started strutting around in something like that, it's not going to last very long, i got to say. We're going to have a meeting around the pastor's table. We lost it all. And in so doing, we lost a lot more. The trouble with sliding is you don't realize what you're losing and the rate at which you're losing. The Bible uses the term backsliding. Losing the progress that you've gained. We wonder about what we've lost. What happened to my marriage? Why do my kids talk to me the way they do? How am I going to pay all these bills? Why am I so stressed out? When can I refill my antidepressants? Why won't my boss leave me alone when I'm at home? Where's my Amazon package? Where can I get a replacement belt for my mower deck today? Why isn't the bank open? I need that check to clear. Hey, let's get some Chick-fil-A. That's right, it's Sunday. Do you know that Chick-fil-A is the th number three fast food restaurant in terms of annual revenue? Do you know that Chick-fil-A is only open six days of the week? Do you know what that says? God is all over that. And by the way, you don't have to be number one. That's some of your problem. Your neighbor got a new car, now you need one. Because you're still in high school up here. You're still competing with the jocks and the cheerleaders. You know how quiet he's at? Oh, they're finishing their basement. Guess I gotta finish mine. That's convenient since we're finishing our basement. <laughs> huh? Oh, they bought a cabin up north. Guess I gotta buy a cabin up north. Who are you living for? You're living to compete with people that don't care about you. That aren't even paying attention to you. They don't even know you exist. They don't even know you're trying to compete with them. And if you win, what do you win? Stress, anxiety, exhaustion, divorce attorneys, children who scream at you. Congratulations. You won. We took from God his day because we are greedy. I'm pro-capitalism. I think it's God's way of doing things. If a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. You contribute to the greater good of society, and the society contributes back to you. Give, it shall be given unto you. You serve, people serve you. It's the way society works. If you're incapable, you're a widow, you're an orphan, or you're infirm, then we all rise up collectively to help take care of you. 
when you can't care for yourself. But if you can care for yourself and you refuse to care for yourself, you should go hungry. You say, that doesn't sound very Christ-like. Then you've never read your Bible. If a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. And he that provideth not for his own is worse than an infidel. So not only are you wrong about it not being Christ-like, it's not Christ-like to take care of people who won't take care of themselves. What else do we have here? The devil always lies about how things will turn out. You understand, losing the Lord's Day has cost us more than had we kept it. You say, oh, wait a minute, I get that double time on Sunday. You get that, but you don't know what you're sacrificing for it. You're, you're getting something, but it's a, a pale imitation of what you could have. Hey, Eve, I see you eyeing that fruit. Yeah, looks good. It's pretty. I'd like to see what it tastes like. Seems like it tastes good. Yeah, not only that, but you eat that, you'll be like God. Is that true? The devil is a liar, and he is the father of lies. There's no truth in him. And he comes to Eve, and he says, Eve, look, it, you're just trading. You're trading pleasing God for being like him. Wouldn't you rather be like him instead of him. Think about it. If you were like him, you wouldn't have to please him. That's what the devil tells us. By the way, he tells the same lies today. Eve saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. 1 John 2.15 says, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, good for food, lust of the eyes, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, pride of life. Same stuff, same tricks. We keep falling for it over and over and over again. You don't know what you're losing when you trade what God has for you for what the devil tries to sell you on. God says, I'll die if I eat that. You won't die. And what's the big deal about missing church one week? One week turns to two. Two turns to three. Three turned to two months. Two months turns into the preacher just pulled in the driveway. Hi. <laughs> Not kidding. People hide from me. If, if you should know the hits my self-esteem takes. I have, I have heard people rush through the house like they're gathering their belongings to get on the last helicopter out of Vietnam. Get out of here. Man, I've seen people in the window pop up and rush down the hallway because I show up at their door. How would that make you feel? But they're running. You know why they're running? Not because I'm going to be mean to them. I'm not mean to people who miss church. I'm coming to check on you. Are you okay? Can I invite you back? Won't you come back? We love you. We miss you. And I don't, I don't turn any screws. You know, if you really love God, I just, just come back. You know, you, you know where you ought to be. And I, I love you. And if you don't, I'm still going to love you. I'm not mean to people. I'm not one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but they run. Why are they running? It's conviction. It's guilty conviction. The devil says, hey, take God's day and use it for yourself. Make it Harry's day. Make it Ashton's day. Make it Dan's day. Right? Whose day is it? The Lord's day. we got to hurry. Let's finish this. Let's finish it, shall we? The devil says, take God's day and use it for yourself. He says, you'll have more time. You'll have more money. 
you'll have more happiness. No. No, no. You'll have less time. You'll have less money. You'll have less happiness. Guaranteed. You don't take from God and end up better off. Where, what planet are you living on? Let's say it again. You don't take from God and end up better off. I'll just take God's day. Yeah, that'll work out well. You know, the principles of giving in the Bible also relate to giving God his day. Proverbs eleven twenty four says this, There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. You say, that doesn't make sense. It's called a paradox. It's one of God's spiritual principles that he puts into motion just to keep you from realizing that you're not in control of this. There is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Ecclesiastes 11.1 1 says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. You know what God will do to the person who gives the Lord his day? He'll give you time back. By the way, if you need that extra day, you don't have a problem of not enough time. You have a problem of poor time management. You know, it's, it's interesting that uh, Benjamin Franklin, who's credited with hundreds of inventions, you know he had the same 24 hours that you have? He's just not binging the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Huh? Huh? People use their time differently. And by the way, they spend their money differently. Well, they're, they're, I just heard they went on vacation. How can they afford that? Oh, they're not getting drunk three days a week. They're probably taking the money you're spending getting drunk and going on vacation with. Cigarettes are $8 a pack, Rick Anik tells me. Nine! That's a lot of cash, man. That's a lot of bones. Let's see. Let's do the math real fast. One pack a day, let's do it at 10, just for the ease of math. $3,650 a year. That's how they went on vacation. If you don't give the Lord his day, when will God get his time from you? Can we all agree that God is due some of our time? Is he going to get it from you on Monday? He's not. And you know it. Because you've got to get up early, you've got to get the kids ready for school, and you've got to make sure their lunches are packed. You've got to make sure that their homework's in their folder. You've got to wait in that long line to drop them off. And our, children, or our parents used to just say, don't be late for school. That's what my parents told me. Don't be late for school. They didn't drive me anywhere. And then when, when, my, when I went to high school and had to ride a bus, guess what I had to ride? The bus. Take me to school. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, God will get his time from you on Tuesday when you have that 445 conference call that lasts until 6.15. Maybe he'll get it on Wednesday. Maybe Thursday. Maybe Friday. When is God going to get his time if you don't set a day aside for it? He's not going to get it. Let's stop fooling ourselves. The Lord's day is for church and serving God. That's what the Lord's day is for. This day right here, from the moment your eyes popped open until the moment you lay your head down tonight, it's for church and serving God. That's what it's for. We don't recreate on Sundays. We went to Richfield Park, and Winston saw the, the motocross, or not motocross, the, the, the BMX track. What's that called? BMX track? There's no cross? There ought to be a cross. Anyway, the BMX track there at Richfield Park, and he said, man, Dad, that looks fun. And so we bought him a mongoose BMX bike for one of his birthdays. And uh, he loved his bike, and we'd take, it, take him to Richfield Park, and he'd ride the tracks. Then he saw this poster on the wall, and he said, Dad, look, there are races, and there are racing teams, and we can race BMX. I said, great, let's look at it. All races are held on Sunday. I said, well, son, looks like you won't be racing BMX. 
oh, what a terrible father you are. If only you weren't a pastor, you could have let that happen. No, if only I weren't a Christian. Why is my Lord's Day any different than your Lord's Day? You say, oh, don't you think you hurt your son's psyche? I hope so. <laughs> Isn't it time somebody told their children you don't get everything you want? I don't get everything I want. Why should they get what they want? Especially if it comes at the expense of me getting what I want teasing, but my goodness. Son, you won't be racing BMX. He said, what if the races are between services on Sunday? I said, you won't be racing BMX because we don't recreate on Sunday. We go to church and we serve God on Sunday. It is the Lord's day, not BMX. And by the way, lest you think I'm beating him up, he was like eight and I wasn't doing it. I was just, son, we don't do those things on Sunday. See, some of your kids are going to end up out of church when they're adults because you do things like that on Sunday. You're training your kids now that the Lord's Day is not important. And you're training them that church is not important on the Lord's Day. So, so you're going to call me and you're going to say, Pastor, we need some counsel. My son's 16, and he just told us that he's not coming back to church anymore. It's because somewhere along the line, you taught him it wasn't important. You didn't make it fun. You didn't teach them that serving God is a good thing. Man, we have a blast serving God around here. Look at this joint. You kidding me? We love serving God around. We just shot bows and arrows at people's heads. Look, you can have a good time serving God. The Lord's Day is for church and serving God. Here are my Sundays. Get up very early in the morning. Groom, get out the door as fast as I can. I go straight to Tim Hortons. I get a small ice cap and a double chocolate donut. I thank God for the donut and the ice cap, and I ask him to bless it to my body. I'm seeking miracles first thing on Sunday morning. And I drive back roads, and I pray, and I talk to God. And then I listen to a little bit of the Bible. And then I listen to a little bit of a sermon. And I pray, and I talk to God. And I show up here right about 8.30, sometimes a minute or two before, sometimes a minute or two after. We come in and we unlock every door and we turn on every light and we make sure that the temperature is nice and cold. And then we teach Sunday school at 9 o'clock and we go to church at 10 o'clock. It's 11.26. We'll probably be out of here by 11.35. And then we'll stick around and we'll talk a little bit. And then we'll leave between 12 and 12.15, be home typically about 12.30 in the afternoon. And then we have lunch as a family. And then sometimes we take what is known as the Baptist nap. Sometimes the Baptist nap lasts 10 minutes, sometimes 20. In a wonderful world, it lasts a full hour. Usually doesn't, but sometimes it can. And then, 3 o'clock, we're gathering our things, we're making sure the tie's back around the neck, we grab the car keys, and we're out the door by 3.15, and we're back at church at 3.30, and we do a pre-trip inspection on a bus, we climb on that bus and we head out to serve God. And we pick up boys and girls whose parents would never bring them to church. We bring them in to teach them the Bible, and they would never otherwise hear the Bible taught. You understand that? You say, why is this nation going to hell in a handbasket? Because people would rather recreate on the Lord's Day than go find the next generation and teach them the Bible on the Lord's Day. Look, you complain about the problem, you're part of the problem. I need some, something to cool that sting, you know. We pick up them kids and we bring them into church and we 
get up at 5 and we teach Sunday school. And all over this property, there's three little boys' classes over here in the basement that are learning Sunday school. There are four little girls' classes downstairs. Shannon has the teenager girls in there. And then I've got the uh, three draft, draft dodgers and, and uh, four, you know, in here. We teach Sunday school. And then we have night church. The teenagers are in here and we sing and we pray and we preach. And then about 7 o'clock we dismiss and we get back on those buses. And we take those kids home. And as the driver of that bus, I watch in the mirror those little kids hug Nicole around the neck and say, I love you, Miss Nicole. I'll see you next week. And for some kids, I'm not saying all of them, but for some of them, on the Lord's day is the only day they hear someone say, I love you. But you're golfing on the Lord's day. We get back about 8 o'clock at night. Sometimes the bus workers go, you want to hit Applebee's or Mega? And we'll go sit down and we'll have something to snack on and something to drink. We'll get home at 10 or 10.30. And you know what we had? A good day. But you got a garden to weed. I get it. I mean, I know there are six other days in the week you could weed that garden. But I mean, come on, let's use the Lord's Day for that important task. Yeah, we're going there. I'll tell you when people start catching on, when things start falling apart. By the time they start falling apart, you're too late to catch on. Might work for you, but your little ones, man, you miss that window. I'm not mad at you. I'm on your side. I'm just trying to talk to you. Because it matters. It matters greatly. It matters more than you realize it matters. <sighs> the thing about not giving God your life is that you don't know what you're missing and you don't know what it's costing you. We're done. We've got to be. 20 more minutes here easily, you know that. The Lord's Day is a good day. And this nation was a better nation when we observed it as a nation. And as a nation, we've left it. There's no doubt about it. If anyone's going to keep the Lord's Day, it's us. And let me tell you what you just got to do. You just have to alter your life significantly and now. That's what you do. You don't say, well, we're going to ease into this thing. You're playing games. You'll never ease it enough. Hmm? <sighs> i got to start cutting weight again. I'm aware of it. And you know what? When I try to ease into it, guess how much weight I cut? Zero. I mean, I might step on the scale the next day and go, ooh, 0.4 pounds less. But it doesn't work. You know what I got to do? I have to just buy different foods and get the garbage out of the house. And I have to put in my calendar, this time to this time, I'm on that spin bike. And this time to this time, I'm doing these body weight exercises. Yes. This time to this time, I'm at the park, run walking that couch to 5k app again huh I just gotta do it there's no playing it. anything you do that's ever worth anything in your life takes consistent effort on your part and if it's worth having you'll do it but you'll never do it if you don't think it's worth it my job is to try to get we're done. If you're here this morning and you're not certain you're on your way to heaven, we started talking about that, didn't we? Blood washed our sins away. 
we're all sinners. We all have to be forgiven of our sin. If you can't remember a time in your life when you put your faith in Christ, in a moment, we're all going to stand. Brent Dixon's going to start playing the piano. People from all over the room are going to come forward and kneel at the altar. If you're here this morning, you've never accepted Christ as Savior, come with them. and We'll take the Bible and show you what God has to say about it. And you can leave here knowing for sure you're on your way to heaven. No doubt. If you're here and you, you say, I know that, but I've never been baptized to get baptized today. We have everything you need to get baptized. You come, baptistry's full, it's warm, we got something for you to wear, you're ready to go. Do it. If you need to join the church this morning, come, make that commitment. If you're here this morning, you say, you know, I've not given God his day. It's not his morning. It's his day. And I'm coming to commit. I'm going to give God his day. Let's stand together, please. Father, help us. Oh, we need your help in more ways than one. Lord, work in our hearts. Help us to grow this morning. May we rise to the challenge, please. We love you. We need you. If there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know Christ as Savior, let them come. Let them know for sure before they leave here that their sins are forgiven. If anyone here needs to be baptized, let them come. And Lord, may we all come and recommit our lives to giving you your day proper. Thank you for the precedent you set in resting on that seventh day. Help us now to honor you on the Lord's day. Bless this invitation, please. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The piano plays. The altar is open. You come. Never hesitate. The devil will talk you out of coming. Never wait. Move on that first note. Come do business with God. If you're here and you're not saved, please, please come and let us show you how you can know for sure. Those of you at the altar, take your time this morning. We're in no hurry. Thank you for your attention. You may be seated. Ushers, will you come forward? Let's receive our offering at this time, please. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I'll tell you, my goodness, I was shocked, shocked, I tell you, <laughs> when I learned what Have came faith. in in the offering. Have faith, yeah. Uh, our budget is $3,500 a week. Guess what came in last week? $2,652. $52.07. We haven't done that in 14 weeks. We haven't had that low of a week. Now, to be fair, once it's averaged out over the month, we may still end up hitting budget weekly, weekly for the month. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you gave all your tithes to Brother Areza. I'm not sure. It was a really good love offering for him. Make sure you understand love offering is over and above your regular tithes and offerings. But having said all that, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Please continue. Dad, would you pray for this offering?
that Nerf gun, I was shooting Nerf pellets at everybody, but I don't think I should do that with a bow and arrow. We might put somebody's eye out, eh? Here are your announcements, and we'll get you on your way. This week's prayer emphasis is continued prayer for the spring program. Uh, we're off to a rip-roaring start. Praise be to God. Fourteen people saved last week, and four of them baptized. That is a big deal. Never, never, never get over that. I, you, you understand, there are churches in this county won't see that happen all year long. That's crazy, absolutely crazy. But, uh, we, you know, don't get over it. Be grateful that God allows us to see it. Spring program is our prayer. Beginners, here's your Bible reading. Philippians, uh, let's see, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and 1st and 2nd Timothy. All them minor uh, epistles there in the New Testament. So basically, Philippians through 2 Timothy. Advanced readers, man, you got a complicated hodgepodge here. Jeremiah 36 to 52, so finish Jeremiah, all of Lamentations, and then Ezekiel 1 through 30. So wherever you left off in Jeremiah, just go through Ezekiel 30, and that'll get you there. Then, let's see here. Tonight, preaching on what to do when you're alone. Really weird way this sermon came about. We'll talk about it tonight. But what to do when you're alone. Uh, Wednesday night, Bible study, continuing our series, a mini-series, as it were, on uh, how to be a laborer for God. And then Thursday night, soul and visitation at 7 o'clock. Year to date, we've seen 36 folks trust Christ as Savior and 14 of them baptized. So praise God for that. Uh, spring program continues through May the 30th. Mother's Day is in there. May the 9th, we have a missionary coming. Wednesday, May the 19th, named Josh Zwarga. And then on May the 30th, the final Sunday of the program, Hiles Anderson College Tour Group will be here in the morning service. And we'll enjoy them singing for us. I think the name of the group is the Joyful Melodies. They're both joyful and melodious. Isn't that good? All right, let's stand up. We'll pray and be dismissed. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Keep working. Keep striving. Get your people here. Invite them to come. You'd be surprised. Do you know that over 80% of people say that the reason they visit a church is because someone invites them to? It's not billboards. It's not television commercials. It's not Facebook ads. It's a personal invitation. So just stay after it. Many of you are well on your way. We're going to compile this week our list of folks who've already had guests and how many they have and so forth so we can give you an idea of where you're at. But stay after it. Don't give up now. We've only just begun, as Karen told us. All right. Let's pray. We'll get out of here. Father, we love you. We're thankful for your goodness to us and for this morning in your house. Thank you for the Lord's day. May we as your people ever stay vigilant to keep it such. We ask your blessing on our afternoon of rest and then again our busyness as we serve you and come back tonight for a second helping. We love you. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.